Ernie was on the phone again. He had probably been on and off for about three hours. His wife, Lynn, was supplying him with constant coffee and homemade biscuits. So there was a silver lining to every cloud. He was making sure that there would be enough tonight to make a viable rehearsal. Some people he couldn't get hold of. He didn't know if they were over their illness or at work. But he wanted at least one in the smaller sections and more in the larger ones. Or it wasn't worth pulling Barry out of the pub to do the rehearsal. Cornets were sorted. He had done those first. It looked like Diane was still ill, but Sophie was coming. And as she was Principal Cornet, and that was all he was bothered about. Liz was going to turn up, although not functioning at full capacity, so don't expect too much, Andy had said. Morris was coming. Ernie had expected him not to. As the oldest member that had attended the function on Saturday, and as he was off on Monday, Ernie thought he would be a definite absentee. But no, according to Maurice, he felt as right as rain. All the other people who had played on Saturday were not coming, apart from Liz and Maurice. Keith said he felt better, but had had his shift changed at work, so wasn't coming. Ernie couldn't keep up with him, but often the atmosphere in the band room was better with him not there so that was fine. He had the other trombones coming, so he wasn't bothered. He had one euphonium, one baritone, two horns, one of each tuba, and four percussionists out of five. That was plenty. He hoped, though, that this bug, or whatever they had, cleared up soon as it was due to snow next week, and he would hear every excuse in the book to get out of band. Rehearsal time was short for this caroling job with the school. He was just thinking about putting extra vitamins in the band's teapot when the phone rang. Jeff was an ex-serviceman, always pristine in appearance and very stern. He didn't suffer fools gladly and had no sense of humour whatsoever. Other people found him very hard to get along with, which was fine as Jeff didn't get on with most of the band either and got extremely annoyed when people didn't pull their weight. Jeff was determined to take over the band at some point in the future, and then he would crack down on this lackadaisical behaviour. He had a list of forbidden actions. Firstly, not turning up to every band job and rehearsal. Secondly, not practising their parts at home. Thirdly, tea breaks. They were out. Tea was for the sick and infirm. His son Sean played on percussion and tonight they were on their way to band practice with brass band music playing on the CD in the car. Sean was a very decent young man, although since young Bob had started, he had noticed Sean and Bob being a little disruptive at the back of the band room, especially during March season, when they had little to do. Tonight, Ernie had told him he was flying solo, as Darren was still off due, the mystery illness contracted on Saturday. Jeff thought this mystery illness was probably alcohol-related and thus shameful to miss two rehearsals. That was unheard of in his book. He felt that there was more to this matter than met the eye. This required more investigation than a sacking. Gary set off in his old Land Rover. He was big friends with Tony who had persuaded him to get one for himself and he had never looked back. It was especially handy for his plumbing business and it always started. Even if it didn't, Tony knew what to do about it and would come over. Then it would be soon chugging along again. Tonight, Gary was giving Danny a lift to band. Ernie had said it was like a friar plague and he was glad, and so was Ernie, that he hadn't played on Saturday as he was the only flugelhorn and would be sorely missed. Danny would be the only baritone tonight as Stephen was still ill. Probably the band wouldn't be able to tell, as Stephen wasn't the best musician, and half the time kept his instrument in his lap. So, it was only usually Danny that you heard anyway. Gary pulled up outside Danny's house, and as Danny was looking out between the curtains for him, he came straight out. He opened Gary's back door and put his instrument on the seat, then got in the front, rubbing his hands against the cold. All right, Gary? he said. Aye, I am. Are you? Not come down with the lurgy, have you, from band? No, I've not seen anyone since Wednesday. 
Can you smell garlic on me? I've had bolognese. Yeah, I can. I'm glad you're not sitting next to me all night. You can't have garlic on the nights you're rehearsing. Smells like that. Stick for ages down your instrument. You want to do what I do and have a chippy tea. Pudding, peas and chips. You can't have that every time, Gary. I do, Gary replied. You can't beat it. I'd be making other smells if I had peas every night, Danny laughed. That is why this cat lives alone. No ladies to moan at me. Free and easy I am at night. A waft of the duvet and it's away. It's only natural, Danny laughed. Actually, I would wind your window down, just to be safe, Gary said, slightly embarrassed. Danny didn't laugh at this and wound his window down as the waft of digested peas began to get to him. Are you having a pint after Danny? I was going to. Oh yeah, we'll have a pint. There is always something to moan about after band. There is indeed. How's the motor? I think she's going to the big scrapyard in the sky. I'm going to have to sort another one out. Get one of these. You will never look back. Join the Tony and Gary Club. I'll definitely think about it. I don't want another one of those pieces of crap anyway, Danny said. Gary indicated right and started to slow down to turn down the road to the band room. As they bumped down the country track, Danny nearly hit the ceiling with the combination of the bumps and the suspension on the Land Rover as he was a good six feet, four inches tall. On second thoughts, I might not survive one of these. Just brace yourself on the dashboard, Gary said. They pulled up outside the band room, got out their instruments and went inside. Right, Ernie said. Looks like everyone who is coming is there. Two have made the effort to come, even though they have had this illness from Saturday. So can we show our appreciation for Liz and Maurice? There was a few seconds of clapping from the rest of the band. Ernie waited until it had ended and spoke again. Very important that everyone tries to make all rehearsals, as so many are off, and we need a balanced band to practice this music for the school gig. So watch whose germs you're breathing and don't do any skiing. This was a little joke of Ernie's, but it didn't raise any kind of appreciation. It's armistice this Sunday, so I need everyone fighting fit. Anyway, very kindly, the bloke who booked us last week has sent a few bottles of wine for us to have. Morris bumped into him, just by chance. Can I stress that only non-drivers have a glass at the break? Whatever's left will be going for raffle prizes at Christmas. He walked back to his chair at the back, and Barry took control of the rehearsal. They started with a hymn, ran through Land of Hope and Glory, and had just started Jerusalem, when Barry stopped the band, holding his hand over his nose and mouth. Someone's bell stinks of garlic! he shouted. Gary looked over his glasses at Danny, and their eyes met. He gave a brief nod. Told you so, it said. Sorry, Barry, Danny said quietly. I've had bolognese. Hell's teeth, lad. My toes are curling. Point your bell elsewhere. Everyone laughed, and Danny blushed a little, but laughed along with them. He tilted his chair more to the right. Bloody Nora! Pat squawked. This is the one time I wish Stephen was here in between us, blocking that stench. Everyone laughed again. Liz looked at Maurice. He could see that she was taking deep breaths, as if to stave off vomiting, and her eyes were full of tears. Her fingers were holding onto her instrument so tight that the knuckles were white. He looked up, and their eyes met. Maurice stood up, then picked up his stick. Sorry, Barry. I think it's a bit too much too soon for me. I'll have to get off home. Do you want someone to take you? Make sure you get in, OK? No, no, you'd better not. Probably safest. OK, fair enough. Get to bed. I'll ring you tomorrow. Yes, all right. Night, everyone. Night, they all called back, and Maurice quickly shut the door. They waited a few seconds, then Sophie said, I hope it's nothing catching, because he has been sitting next to me for half an hour. It's bad enough I've got my mother ill. I don't need old man disease as well. Watch it, Ernie said. 
He could be right outside the door. And that's rude anyway, Sophie. Besides that, he has got what your mother has anyway. And you haven't caught it from her, have you? Sophie humphed and started fiddling with her music. He didn't look good, did he, poor fella? said Andy. No, and I was thinking how good he looked when he came in earlier. He was walking a lot faster than usual and didn't look as tired. He must have just gone off. Ernie shrugged. I think he got a whiff of that garlic. If he's been sick, that will put him right off, especially if it's his stomach that is dicky. Pat grunted. Thanks, that's made me feel loads better about my bolognese, Danny replied. Don't have it again on band night, Barry said, shaking his head. They are dropping like flies as it is. Maurice got outside the band room and took in the fresh, cold night air through his nose several times. He didn't breathe it in. He didn't breathe any more, so he couldn't. The smell of that garlic was terrible. It was all he could do to not just run out of the room without his stick screaming. Starting to relax, the fresh air was slowly wiping away the smell of the garlic. So this was one of the new things he had discovered about himself. There were positives, yes. He felt healthy. He had no pain or stiffness in his leg. In fact, it was as good as the other. His eyesight had improved. He had worn his glasses for band, but looked over the top of them to read the music so as not to be found out. The negatives, well, he couldn't bear garlic, which he used to love. He couldn't go out into the daylight, which was going to stop him visiting one of his old friends in Whitby the week after next. And he was going to spend a fortune on meat if he didn't want to bite someone. He didn't want to name what he was. Maybe he was in denial. But so what? Rome wasn't built in a day. Did he mind? Hmm, that was difficult. No, it wasn't difficult. He did mind. That is why he was lying in word and deed, to just keep his old life. He wasn't exactly embracing it, was he? Plus, he had just worked out that his cornet mouthpiece had been pressing on his new teeth. That wasn't good either. Sandra Jones, or Mrs Jones, as she was known to her pupils, walked out of the bright fluorescent lights of the school foyer into the dark, cold night. She loved this time of year. Her favourite term was the autumn term. New pupils, harvest, Halloween, bonfire night, and now on to Christmas preparations. She had stayed late with Mrs White, who was head of music and Mr Shufflebotham, head teacher, to sort our old Christmas activities. There was the Christmas party to organise, talent show, buying the Christmas tree, the fancy dress competition, the school Christmas fair and three concerts. One for the school only, inside the school hall, one in the church including a Christingle service and a joint one in the village with the local brass band. This was always the best one and her own children enjoyed it because both parents were involved as her husband Simon played with the brass band. As she walked, her mind drifted. She wondered what time her husband would get home tonight. He said he was going for a few drinks with the others. She knew they often had a few drinks. However, she had gone one time, about three months ago, to surprise him, and he hadn't been there. She stayed for a quick one with the others, but she felt they were tense and hiding something. Some of them were over-enthusiastic, which made it worse. Her spider sense was tingling. When she got home, Simon still wasn't in. She waited up, which was unusual. He didn't get back for another hour. She had asked him if he'd enjoyed band, and he said yes, then about going for drinks after, and he said he had been talking about mouthpieces with some of the lads and the benefits of a fourth valve. Then he quickly went upstairs and had a shower. She followed him up and examined his clothes, smelling the lady's perfume on them, that definitely wasn't hers. She looked at his phone and found messages from someone called Tracy. What was in the messages left her no doubt. But what could she do? Confront him, and he could go and be with this Tracy. She decided to sleep on it. Although she didn't sleep much that night. In the morning, after thinking about the children, she decided to leave it and see what happens. The following practice, she followed him and saw where he went. Tracy answered the door and from what she could see from the texts, 
and how Tracy had greeted him. He was pulling the wool over both their eyes. She thought she would hate her, but she didn't, only pity and sadness about the whole situation. She had driven back towards home and felt strangely all right about it all, so had called for a drive through meal from McDonald's, turned her music on and ate her burger and drank her milkshake, singing aloud all the way home. She knew where she was, at least with him now. Sandra knew deep down that tonight he would be late. She was halfway down the school drive when she saw some movement up ahead near the hedge. A crouched figure could just about be seen in the darkness of the November night. It pulled her right out of her thoughts of Simon. Her stomach tensed. Oh no, what if it is a pervert or a group of druggies or something? She looked back at the school entrance and the light was still on, but no sign of Mrs White or Mr Shufflebotham. It was so quiet here, they would definitely hear her scream. Hello? She said quietly. No answer. Hello? She said a little louder and moved two steps backwards. Then she something glitter or glint on their body in the reflections of the school lights. They have a knife! She held her breath. She took another step back. They moved and suddenly stood up, tall. Run! Then at the last moment... She noticed that the silver buttons were on a uniform, and it was a policeman. She let out all her breath in relief. Hello, you had me worried there. She walked further towards the policeman, then realised who it was, especially with the height. He bent down again, away from her, to examine something in the bushes. No band tonight, Keith, she asked. No, come help me with this. I think it's a hurt animal. Sandra walked up beside Keith and looked down at the place he was looking at. Where? It's too dark, I can't see anything. He looked up at her, smiled, then reached up, grabbed two handfuls of her coat, and with his immense strength, pulled her down until she was beneath him. Where was the scream that was in her throat a minute ago? Gone. Just a strange glug noise came out. It wasn't enough to save her. When Mr Shufflebotham and Mrs White wound their way down the long drive in their cars. Ten minutes later, the hedge was empty. All was peaceful again. The Thompsons were walking along the lane in the rain. It ran across the highest peak in Freemere. To the left, there were just moors, now black and silent. To the right, the village of Freemere. From the lowest part of the village, if you looked up, way past all the hills and streets, to the farms above it, this lane looked like the hairline of a giant face. A long punctuation, civil from uncivilised. Michael had parked half a mile away. There were no street lights and very few houses along here. Thus, very few cars. There was no pavement on this lane and it was lined with dry stone walls and high trees at either side. This meant that in November it had thick clumps of rotting leaves. The scent was strong of damp wood mossy rocks, leaves and soil. They arrived at their destination, which was a lovely farm with its entrance on this highest point. But it went down and lay on the side of the hill, as they stood at the top off the track. The natural break in the trees meant they could see the whole of Friar stretching out beneath them, all the little lights making straight and curvy patterns, like a toy village. How many parents were telling their children fairy tales where good triumphs over evil, then tucking them into bed with a drink of hot chocolate, to dream of dragons and trolls and adventures that would never happen in real life. No boogeymen here, of course. What a perfect and lovely village they lived in. What an idyllic setting where children were safe to play in the streets, where so many happy memories were made. Nothing could ever happen here. That was for other places. One of the bogeymen, Michael read the sign out loud to his brother. Lazy Farm. This was the one he had thought of. He had noticed this place on one of his walks and thought it was ideal for his purpose. Come on, Stephen, he said, and they began to walk down the cobbled path towards the farm. Within five minutes, they had passed over the cattle grid and were well and truly on farm property. 
Michael knew there was a public footpath here that led back down through the village. It was definitely less work, better parking and flatter ground. However, it came out right in the middle of a large settlement of detached houses, so he knew he would have to enter and exit from this way, or risk being discovered. He was just wondering if he had gone too far when he noticed the stile on the path, which gave entrance to the corner of the field on the other side of the wall. He looked over squinting, trying to see through the darkness, but he could see little. He thought he could hear movement, though, before getting his mobile phone out to use as a light. He quickly glanced towards the farm to check all was safe. He switched on the light and in the distance could see the milky white oval shapes of a few sheep. Go on then, they're in there. What are? asked Stephen. Sheep, and that's what you'll be having from now on. Norman said that for the moment we should keep a low profile and just eat raw meat. I thought he meant from the shop. Yes, he did, but we aren't made of money and you don't get fresher than that in that field. I am assured you can cope with any eventuality, but as they aren't turned yet, I won't be partaking. Norman has told me I'm meant for great work with him, so he's keeping me alive for the moment. I don't think I'm going to like doing this. Michael thought for a moment, then said, How do you know if you haven't tried it? Stephen nodded. You're right there. Have you got a penknife or something like that, Michael? Why are you going to whittle them something first? No, to stab them. No, you'll have to bite through the wall, Stephen. Oh, I don't really want to do that. It is on his orders to eat raw meat, and it is on my orders that this is the meat you are eating. Get used to it, because until he tells me otherwise, this is your dining table. Stephen took a couple of steps forward and seemed to be squaring the notion in his head. Then he put one of his hands on the top of the stile and vaulted quickly over, easily jumping six feet into the air. He started to walk into the darkness. By the way, Stephen. Stephen stopped and turned towards him, his face white and his eyes dark and hollow in the night. He was changing for the kill, and Michael was scared. It just occurred to him that he was in danger while he was still alive. He cleared his throat and coughed. Bring the carcass back up with you. It will only get covered in maggots and stuff here. I am partial to a bit of mutton. I'll see you at the gate when you are finished. Don't come up until you are satisfied. He quickly walked away, and out of the corner of his eye, saw Stephen turn back and walk towards the flock. Ten seconds later, he heard a dreadful scream of pain, and knew Stephen had begun his evening meal. The next time would be easier. He walked quickly up the track, his chest really taking the strain, as he gasped to cope with the steep incline to the top. At least it had stopped raining now. He could hear the rest of the sheep running from the carnage, bleating in panic. Run and hide, little sheep. You won't escape your fate. He will get you next time. He chuckled to himself. As long as he could control Stephen until he was turned to, this was going to turn out great but he didn't like the look on Stephen's face when he was standing in that field. That scared him. He was different, changed, pale, freakish. This wasn't his brother anymore. For a slight instant, he thought he had made a mistake. What had he done? Was it worth it? There was no going back now. No taking anything back to the shop for a refund and setting things to rights. His brother was a monster. Plain and simple. In fact, he didn't have a brother any more. His brother was dead, and he was now an only child. He reached the top of the hill and stood with his hand on the gatepost of the farm, looking down towards the track. He couldn't hear anything and wondered what was going on. Looking up to the sky, he felt that nothing would be the same again, which was great as his life had been shit. His mother had left them when they were younger for his father's best friend, and when he was seventeen, his father died. Little Stephen was only six, so he had looked after him, hadn't he? That's what the rest of the family all expected. His aunties and uncles and cousins and the odd grandparent. They wouldn't have accepted that he should go into care, and he agreed. But it wasn't easy. 
They helped with a few cooked meals, some extra money, and looked after Stephen while Michael had worked. Somehow he had coped, got Stephen to an adult age where he could look after himself. Surprisingly, now looking back, it seemed a short time, but it had left him changed. It was hard to make and sustain friendships, never mind romantic relationships, when you had to look after your younger brother every night. And look at him now, forty years old with no friends, no wife or children of his own. He just had Stephen, and at twenty-nine, Stephen just had him too. Well, their luck had just changed, hadn't it? This was where they started, getting the women and the power and everything they always wanted. He thought he saw a movement in the field to the right of him, and after a few seconds recognised that it was Stephen coming towards him. It was hard to see him, because he looked so dark, and as he got closer, a cloud moved away from the moon above him. Michael now noticed in the moonlight that Stephen was not just dark, but a dark red. He was covered in blood. His face, the front of his hair, his shirt, shoulders, arms and hands. Michael's breath caught in his chest as he absorbed the horrible sight. The top of his jeans were still blue, but his knees were black with a combination of blood and mud. In amongst the strong smells that emanated from him, there was also another whiff. Maybe sheep poo. He swallowed his throat, very dry. What the bloody hell? said Michael. I've made a mess. I can see that. How am I getting you home like that? I don't know. Have you got some baby wipes in the car? I think it might take a bit more than that. You can't see yourself, can you? Where's my fresh mutton as well, he? Back down there. I've come up for the bin bag you said you would put the body in. You could have brought it up here, you bloody fool. Saved your legs. No, I must have gone a bit mad, and it's in pieces. You know, chunks and bits of lumps and stuff. It's still good meat, though. Definitely the legs are still whole. Michael stood with his mouth open and thought long and hard. He unrolled the roll of bin bags that were in his pocket. One or two? he asked. I'd better take two, he replied. Michael rolled off two bags and tore them quickly at the perforations, then handed them to Stephen, who turned around and clumped slowly back down the field. Michael rolled a few more bin bags out and started to open them flat. He would put them on his car seat. The baby wipes would just have to do until they got home.